So I would like to start in the challenging case of presenter six, and it's my great pleasure to honor to be here with this wonderful Seventh Complex PCI 2022. My name is Young Nan, and my co-chairperson Chi Yuan Wang from Hong Kong. The opportunity, the first speaker did not appear, so we will start in the second presenter and with the presentation. So I will to present in the first uh, speaker, and next one is uh, Dr. Ong and the case by one by one. So I'd like to introduce in the first presentation the simultaneous no flow phenomenon and the abrupt vessel closure in rotational atherectomy result in cardiac arrest. So case presenter is Wong Wanis Apirajarawat from Thailand. The Dr. Apri Rat, what, please? Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, good morning. <laughs> so I'm Dr. Wong Wuri Sapiti Rat from the Korean Circuit, Naval Hospital, Thailand. Uh, we're pleasure to present this case in this session. I am nothing to disclose. This is a crest profile of the 60 year old man with a history of the hypertension, dyslipidemia, ESRD, or regular hemodialysis. He reported the chest pain during the uh, last session of the hemodialysis and pain persists for around 40 minutes. He also reported the dyspnea and the palpitation. The top three is significantly elevated uh, echocardiogram showed the borderline LV systolic function. LVF around 50% with the anterior wall hypokinesia. So diagnosis was the non stemmy high risk and sent for the CAG. This is the angiogram. The angiogram shows the, uh, the critical stenosis of the osteocircs and the mid LVD as you seen in the angiogram here, the mid LVD and the osteocirc. The cranial view show the show the, also the same uh, detail and uh, they show the severe calcified along the vessel and the prop to the mid lesion of the LAD and the cirque. Okay, and spider wheel can show also to the critical stenosis of the cirque and the mid LAD as well. The RCA had a non-significant stenosis but a severe calcified lesion. So our strategy to, uh, to in this patient is the target lesion, uh, the LAD and the cirque. So we choose the, the seven, uh, seven friend guiding catheter. We use, choose the IWAS to assess the lesion, the calcify, and the vessel diameter. And the lesion modification, because the NGO cam showed the severe calcify, so we plan to the rotor better starting at 1.5 and then maybe upgrade to uh, 1275 or the 20 bird. We plan to stand in the mid LED first and then rotor to the third. So this is the eye wash uh, from the LED pullback. Uh, you can see that the, the eye wash shows the uh, circumferential and superficial calcification along the mid LED vessel. And the distal reference uh, of the LED is a 3.0 millimeters. And surprisingly, at, uh, from the angel can we we, uh, we not expect the critical lesion at the distal left main, but the I was show the critical the left main disease and the severe calcify along the the distal left main lesion, and uh, uh, at the left main has no disease and uh, the left main different diameter about the four point four point zero millimeter to the four point five millimeter. So we compare the IWAS with the angiogram. The distal left man has the minimal luminal area about 4.7 mm square, and the mid LED had a distal reference about 3.0 mm. Okay, so uh, from the IWAS detail, so we, we performed the Rota beta 1.5 bird to the LAD. You can see the uh, rota bird can pass uh, easily at the distal left main lesion. Uh, I perform the high, high, high velocity uh, rota beta, and the I was can pass to the distal LAD with with the easily. So we perform the low speed run of the rota beta, uh, and the final polishing run. There is no complication at at this time. So um, because the left main, the distal left main had a, 
significant disease, uh, and I, I think the 1.5 per rotabator could not uh, adequately uh, plant modification. So I up up to the 2.4 uh, 2.0 per rotabator to the distal main and the mid LAD. And this uh, this is the road rota run. You can see at the, some uh, resistance at the mid LAD. And uh, we performed the, the last run. Uh, after the rotabator passed this duration, the patient developing chest pain and then uh, acute develop suddenly hypotension. The baseline blood pressure is around uh, 150 and drop, drop to 50 millimeter mercury suddenly. And then the patient had a cardiac arrest. So I performed the angiogram. Uh, angiogram show the no for phenomenon of the LAD. So we start the CPR and uh, start adrenaline intercalary. And uh, we quickly remove the rota wire out and change to the workhorse wire. The CPR uh, around 10 minutes, the, the patient developed the ROSC. So uh, at, this, at this time, we suspect that the mechanism of the no uh, phenomenon may be found the emboli. We tie to the uh, Aspiration catheter to the distal ID, but nothing was obtained from, from the vessel. So uh, we uh, performed the pedilatation with the 2.5 balloon at the mid LED, but uh, the patient still had a cardiac arrest again. And uh, uh, we start the high dose of the dopamine at the non epinephrine. So at this time, uh, after CPR and giving a high dose of the vessel pressure and the uh, intercalary adrenaline, uh, we plan to stay uh, stand by uh, with the 3.0 by 30 millimeter stand at the mid LED. This is the angiogram after the CPR and stenting at the mid LED. You can see that uh, at least the three me four after LD stenting. Problem resolved, but uh, when I look at the monitoring of the patient, the patient still had a severe hypotension. The blood pressure about uh, 60 millimeter mercury despite the high dose of norepinephrine and dopamine. And ECG showed the, uh, showed the ST elevation in one and AVL. If you look closely at the angiogram, you can see that the CERC and the DG1 both disappear. So uh, the patient developed no for phenomenon and the abrupt vessel closure at the same time. So uh, at, as, uh, at this point, we would uh, rescue the patient first, rewind to the serve with the Xion black wire and pedilatation to the serve. Uh, and after, uh, after we, we rest our flow to the serve, the blood pressure is significant rising. And at, at this time, uh, we will not have the, the time to prepare the rest, uh, the the serve as we planned before. So we, we plan to deploy to stand the serve with a 2.75 stand at the mid uh, at the astial serve. So we perform the re reverse tap technique to the left main LVD and serve here and deploy the 3.5 by uh, 50 15 millimeter stand to the left main LVD like this. Okay, and we uh, revive with the filter XGR and uh, perform the kissing balloon with the 3.0 in the LED and 2.5 in the SIR. And this is the, the result of after the kissing balloon of the uh, LED and SIR. It showed a good flow after this. And we uh, came Rewind and open the DG1 because they have the significant uh, ST elevation in the lateral list. And we perform the kissing balloon of the LD stand and the DG1. And the DG1 is just pull bar, just balloon with the 2.0 semi compound balloon to open the DG1. Not, uh, not plan to stenting it because the patient is still re required a high dose vessel pressure. And this is the final angiogram. The final angiogram. Uh, angiogram show the good flow at, at the LED cell and uh, also DG1. Okay, 
Okay, and we check check the IWAS. The IWAS of the left main, this top left main, and the mid LED is well at position, well expansion, but the the lesion at the uh, stand at the surface, osteocirc maybe have the under expansion of uh, of standing. But but it's I think this is a good result for me. Not 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 the perfect result, but uh, we can save the patient. The vessel pressure can uh, be tapered off on the next day, and the patient will be safely discharged at the day three after the operation with the full of neurologic uh, recovery. So the discussion point, what is the etiology of the no reform phenomenon and the abrupt vessel was closure at, uh, at the same time in this case? Uh, and is 1.5 or 1.7 fiber rotational arthrectomy adequate for the prior debugging lesion to avoid the complication like this? In conclusion, the no reform phenomenon accompanied by uh, abrupt vessel closure after rotabator can be occur at the same time and lead to devastating situation. Simple and fast action should be done to save the patient's life. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much uh, for your wonderful bayright procedure uh, after rot 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 rotational arthrectomy and then abrupt vessel closure. So we have uh, four panelists in the Chu Hyun Kim, Hyun Woo Park, and the Sujai Nikhil Ramakrishnan, and then Kitty Gon Pichai Ruan Sum. So is there any questions or comments from the panelists? Uh, thank you for a uh, for nice presentation. Uh, about the uh, rotabator cocktail regimen. Which regimen did you use in this case? Uh, the, I, I used the nitroglycerin and the, just the, the uh, normal saline in this case. Okay, uh, some report, if you use the uropamil based or decorandil based mm. cocktail regimen, mm -hmm. they have some data to prevent uh, the throw fall or the no fall in the rotabator. Mm. And uh, Throw four and no four in rotabator is not the same manifestation like in STEMI. No four in STEMI, it happens very really fast. But in rotabator, frequently it may be happen gradually. Mm -hmm. Maybe it becomes from TIMI-3, TIMI-2, TIMI-1, and then no four. So between you ablation section, between the section, mm -hmm. if you check uh, angiogram to check the flow, or if they have any change in water size or the ECG. Early detection, early given of the vasodilator, uh, we will have better outcome or can prevent this complication. Okay, thank you for your recommendation. And did you use the balloon pump after you finished the procedure? Um, I, I, I did, did not use the balloon pump because the because after we restored the, the flow in the surf, the pressure but pressure the patient can uh, rise significantly, and we can be tapered off the vessel pressure after that. Okay, and this case, I see you start rotator with the high speed. Yes. 200,000. 200, Too high speed in the beginning can induce the platelet uh, activation. Mm -hmm. If you start from uh, a little bit lower, slower, and then you step up to faster, mm -hmm. I think it may be better. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And mm. Just one comment from, uh, for, 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 for the uh, intra uh, management of the patient with cardiac arrest. So, uh, congratulate on your case, uh, which um, eventually does not really need to have um, mechanical surgery support uh, uh, for uh, after the procedure. But um, I think since the patient has uh, cardiac arrest for 10 minutes uh, with a CPR, uh, I, I'm not sure uh, um, the individual hospital practice, but uh, for us, um, maybe we have a lower threshold to uh, start with some sort of mechanical circulation support uh, just because we cannot predict what happened, just like in your case, uh, you, you, you cannot predict whether there is a abrupt closure of the other vessel. So um, perhaps when uh, after the first cardiac arrest, uh, uh, and if 
the vessel is not that urgent, they need to be treated, you just spend a few more minutes to put in the IPP, or in some centers, uh, maybe having a, a more advanced, like um, a, 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 a impeller or um, sort of device like, like this, but uh, perhaps um, putting in some sort of mechanical support upfront will make you feel a little bit released or safe uh, during the rest of the procedure. Um, I have uh, some different idea because, you know, in this situation, it's the due to the procedure in the overload based closure is much more important than the hemodynamic support because, you know, it's very, um, it's even though the, you know, some the um, hemodynamic support, maybe we need in the, maybe more than 10 minutes mm. we need. So I think it's a much more important thing is, it's a uh, rapid to re canalize the noble vessel. So I think it's your procedure probably is acceptable for me. So, but in the, for me, I think it's one question is that in the, when we the, the meet in the, this kind of uh, vessel uh, situation, so we just first start in the rotation arthrectomy first, because I think it's sometimes in the, if it's a superficial vessel calcification area, maybe we just only need the, you know, need in the, some break by some non-compliant balloon or some some the high pressure balloon inflation probably can break the in you know, a region and then maybe we can the, get some the stent implantation in this area because in a in a calcified area you have many very big size of the Dinal branch so it's maybe very high possibility of the dinal branch compromise after rotation arthrectomy. So I think it's, it's very um the you know, some difficult situation but in the you are very wonderful procedure. Mm -hmm. So I wonder that if we have a next time it's it's also it's a good thing or we don't know exactly. So is there any comment from the audience? Okay, thank you very much. We move to the next uh, case presentation. Okay, so the next case presenter is Dr. Swan Lin Chen from Chimei Hospital, Taiwan, and he's going to share with us a case for the topic when it rings, uh, it pours, having two complications at the same time. Dr. Chen, please. Hello, everyone. I'm Shen Lin Chen from Taiwan. Today, I will share you with a case having two complications at the same time. I have no potential conflicts. This is an 83-year-old man with multiple CAD risk factors with chest tightness recently. His ECG showed no Q wave uh, and uh, no specific finding, but the salient scan showed abnormal result. He then received angiography, which showed LAD proximal to distal stenosis. Circumflex proximal and OM to OM stenosis, and RCA middle and the distal stenosis. The, this is a triple vessel disease, and the syntax score was high. But the patient and his family refused cabbage. So the intervention strategy was complete revascularization. We tried to do the left side firstly. We use EBU guiding catheter and the run through wire. NC balloon was used for pre dilatation. We then deployed to drug eluting stand and used previous NC balloon for post dilatation. We can see something wrong here, but we didn't <coughs> notice it at that time. Then we doing PCI for LAD. However, we know we noticed extravasation over OM branch, distal OM branch layer. So at this time, should we observe or complete PCI or just terminate it immediately? We choose back to the circumflex to fix the problem. What method should we use? Balloon inflation, embolization, or reverse of anticoagulation? 
we use a smaller balloon for prolonged inflammation for twice. And uh, there was no further, further extravasation. We, do not, we did not reverse anticoagulation at this time. The ACT was between three and 400. However, the patient complained sudden of chest pain. The blood pressure and the heart rate dropped to both dropped. We checked echocardiography immediately, which showed no pericardial effusion. So we used fluid challenge and his hemodynamics became stable. It might be re this episode might be related to basal vagal reaction. According to this algorithm, when we met perforation, we could use balloon inflammation to occlude perforated vessel, give intravenous fluid, and perform pericardial synthesis if hypertension. If this is if this is distal perforation, we can use embolization. Reverse anticoagulation can be useful for continued extravasation. However, we noticed another problem. The extravasation was noted at the branch of OM. It's a type C, type C coronary dissection, and the result in intramural hematoma. Due to the patient didn't complain any chest pain or, and he, he, his hemodynamics was stable, we just wait and see. We go back to LAD and uh, try to fix the lesion quickly. We develop de developed to drug eluting stand and use NC balloon for dilatation, post dilatation. The final result of LAD was good. So we back to second phase to see the process of dissection. We can see the flow was slower to Timmy to flow. Then it result in no, no flow and the total occlusion. The territory of this branch was large, so we need to rescue it. What kind of method we could use? Stand, baron, or wire? If we, if we need stand or baron, should we use culo or T stand, kissing or non kissing? According to this, this algorithm for management of dissection, if the wire position was lost, we could try anti grade wiring firstly and use IVERS to check the, to assess the dissection. Cutting balloon or standing could, can be useful. In our case, we just use a small balloon for dilatation and the flow returned to TIMI 3 flow. After removing all the equipment, we used 30 milligrams of protamine for partial reversal of anticoagulation. We checked the results three weeks later and the, the result was good, the flow was good. There are many kinds of acute complication of PCI. In this case, we have two, perforation and dissection. The discussion point is the decision to complete versus immediately terminate when we meet a complication. And the second, method of management of perforation and the dissection. Third, timing and the dosing of administration of potamine. In conclusion, when we run into trouble and having complication, early identification, serial echocardiography, and the hemodynamic monitoring are basic but important. Second, the decision must be based on the relative risk of each option to the patient. Distal perforation can be managed with prolonged balloon occlusion. Simple balloon dilatation without bail outstanding may be effective for type C dissection. And finally, we should prepare the knowledge of effective techniques. This is my case. Thank, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Chen, for the 
uh, interesting showing two complications at the same time. So may I just ask, uh, do you have any IFAS check uh, when you rewire the branch of the OM to see the mechanism of the uh, uh, dissection or how extensive the hematoma is? Have you? Yo, I, I didn't perform IFAS at late time because, uh, the, uh, because the operator was confident of his, his skill, so uh -huh. he didn't perform IFAS there. And, and may I just make a, a clarify, is it just uh, after arriving the TMFE flow is resumed and then uh, the operators uh, terminate the case or they did uh, some sort of balloon dilatation or any intervention to that branch? No, just, just, just only use small balloon to open the dissection and keep the flow TM3. Because we want to, want to do PCI for RCA three weeks later, so we want to check the result at late time. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the result was good, so we didn't do anything for the, the branch. And, and what do you think the reason was the distal branch perforation uh, 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 at the first place? I mean, the, the closer is the, the other complication, the, the, the distal uh, branch perforation, what, what, what do you think the reason is? Maybe the wire, wire, wire too, too distal to mm -hmm. cause the distal perforation, because it may be keep the wire stable, so uh -huh. wire go to more distant. Mm -hmm. distant mm -hmm. area. Okay. So, any other comments from the panels? Uh, for coronary perforation, the f the first thing I do is uh, prolong balloon dilatation, and uh, the second thing I rapidly do the echocardiogram for checking for the tamponade. Okay. And maybe after the procedure you choose serial echocardiogram, it may be delay tamponade after the procedure. Yeah. yeah. We have to echocardiography after the procedure. And it show no pericardial fusion. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, if no more comments or questions, and then I will thank Dr. Chen for presenting the case, and I uh, will pass the chairmanship to um, Dr. An for presenting the next speaker. I'd like to introduce in the third presentation, when it rains, it pours. Oh, no, no. So type 3 coronary perforation rescued by two covered stents. The you know, presenter is the Mohammed Iman Abdul Hafiz yes. from Pantai Hospital Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Okay, thank you very much, um, Chairman, for the kind presentation. My name is uh, Dr. Imran. I'm from Pantai Hospital Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, and I'd like to present my um, presentation today about similar case earlier, um, but slightly more catastrophic. Okay, I have no disclosures. So I'd like to present my case. She was an uh, elderly female, 81 years old, with a past medical history of ischemic heart disease having had um, angioplasty to the right coronary artery in 2015. She also had type 2 diabetes mellitus and she was on hemodialysis via a right arm AV fistula. She was on the following um, medication, nebivalol, atovastatin, tragenta, amlodipine and aspirin. And uh, The reason why I brought her forward for cardiac catheterization was due to her having three previous admissions in six months with angina or chest pain and also she had been having more frequent intradialytic chest pain and also intradialytic hypotension. So due to her age and frailty, I chose not to um, go femoral and radials are my uh, default approach. Uh, I couldn't enter the right forearm due to AV fistula, so I um, did a left um, forearm puncture. Um, the radial artery angiogram was good, good caliber, so I proceeded up with a 5 French TIG catheter. So you can appreciate that there is a distal or mid-body left main stem uh, moderate disease, proximal LED disease and distal uh, LED disease. In the right coronary artery, because this patient um, had angioplasty quite a few years ago and she was uh, having poor LDL control, you can see there was already a development of mild to moderate instant restenosis in the previous RCA um, stent. So I proceeded to choose um, two targets for the angioplasty, i.e. the distal LED and also the proximal um, LED lesion. So engage with an EBU 3.5 launcher with a Terumo run-through floppy wire. 
I pre-dilated with a Helix 2.5 times 15 balloon from Sinovit Medical, okay, to nominal pressure only. I pre-dilated twice at the distal LED lesion. I also prepared the proximal LED lesion with the same balloon at 2.5 times 15 at slightly higher pressures. As you can appreciate in the middle panel, the proximal LED lesion is now open. But you can see that there is um, distal LED recoil in the middle panel. So then I move the same balloon distally and you can see as soon as I, the balloon reaches target, you can see a massive type 3 ELISA perforation. Okay, this is without me doing further ballooning, but I guess the damage <coughs> was already done from um, the prior balloons. So as our panelists and also our um, my colleague has previously done, um, I move the balloon back and tamponade the leak. I leave it for about five minutes, and uh, after five minutes, remove the balloon and uh, uh, um, deflate the balloon, and you can see that the leak still remains. In fact, it's an ac active jet of extravasation and uh, it's coming out from uh, what looks like a longitudinal longitudinal um, injury to the vessel rather than a, a hole. So I managed with much difficulty as I didn't want to reverse um, the protein, I didn't want to reverse heparinization and I don't think reversal of um, heparinization would have um, helped in such a large leak. Uh, so I moved um, a covered stent, a PK papyrus 2.5 times 20 millimeter covered stent from Biotronic uh, at target. You can see that the two dots of the covered stent have actually covered both the proximal edge of the leak and also the distal edge of the leak. Inflate um, covered stent, you can appreciate in the middle panel the leak is, the leak remains at the distal um, edge of the stent. Okay, and this is despite the stent actually, um, as you can appreciate earlier, the stent actually managed to cover both ends of the leak. So, um, a bit of a tricky situation here. And as you can see that even though I tamponade, um, you can see the leak is getting worse. So, I kind of suspect that there was a malfunction with the covered stent as well. And you can see the active excavation of contrast into her pericardial space. The patient uh, is starting to get restless at this point in time. And I think, uh, similar to my colleague's case, her blood pressure also is compromised. So, I tamponade the, tamponade the leak again with a balloon. I, while calling for the echocardiogram, I do um, an emergency pericardial drain via landmark and fluoroscopy. I think probably the fastest pericardial drain I've ever done in my life, about 30 seconds, uh, at which um, 200 mils of blood I've uh, aspirated immediately. I then, um, after the patient is then stabilized with the pericardial drain, her blood pressure then rises again. You can see that the leak is still there, uh, still active. I then attempt to move a second um, covered stent to cover the distal leak. And the problem with this covered stent, it's actually a bigger cover stent than the previous one. So just now was a 2.5 times 20. This is a 3.0 um, papyrus. You can, um, I think my colleagues who have been unfortunate enough like me to have been using covered stent, you can appreciate how bulky these stents are actually. So I'm actually unable to push the stents down um, easily. Finally managed to deep throat a guidezilla quite deep into the LED. Uh, managed to push the covered stent down distal. Uh, distal to the first PK papyrus. I'm overlapping it midway. Okay, and I inflate it at the subnominal um, or just at nominal at seven atmospheres. After waiting a few minutes, you can uh, see that I finally managed to plug the hole. Okay, um, add this uh, to my relief. So then I focus on the proximal and uh, mid-body um, um, lesions where I put in a 3.0 times 48 stent from Microscience Medical and I cover. I managed to cover the mid-LMS um, and also up to the proximal LED. With good results um, from the LED, but you can see that in the third panel, there is a slight dissection in the left main stem. I'm not sure whether this is coming from um, the stand, a stand edge dissection, or from my very uh, aggressive Godzilla maneuvering earlier. 
But nonetheless, after I just managed to pull this patient back from uh, a massive perforation, I wasn't going to leave it to chance. So um, I then implant a, a further stent, a 4.0 times 13 stent from Microscience Medical with an upsize uh, with a 4.5 high pressure NC balloon. And you can see that the final results are looking quite um, quite um, reassuring where you can see there is no more um, leak in the distal LED. Um, and the uh, left main and also the LED lesion has also been um, covered. So I started from this, from pre-angioplasty pictures um, where there was a distal LED lesion, uh, proximal LED lesion and also um, distal left main or mid left main stem disease to the middle panel where um, I developed a perforation. The first perforation in um, 3000 procedures uh, and I've never used a covered stent before. So this is the first time I've used a covered stent uh, and to the final results. So after two covered stents in the distal LED and also two stents in the left main to uh, mid LED, um, these are the final pictures. So how did the patient do after that? I brought her back to the H2, our HDU. The echocardiography as, was as before the procedure where she had normal ejection fraction, hardly any pericardial effusion. Her drain um, only drained whatever I had aspirated in the cath lab, which was about 200 mils alone. And I discharged her um, the next day. She, I'm glad that she's had no further presentations to hospital. And uh, if um, you remember, she had previously come in every two months for unstable angina. She's managing to finish her four-hour dialysis sessions with no further angina, no further intradilytic hypotension. So what are my learning points? So coronary perforations, um, we normally classify them via the Alice um, category, whereby my one was type 3. There's only one type more severe than mine. Um, I'm not sure if it's more severe, but that one is actually if it's leaking into anatomical chambers. So they are actually they are very very uncommon coronary perforations are very uncommon. However, they are potentially deadly. I think if I didn't have covered stents uh, at the time, this patient would probably not have survived um, that day. Particularly with my surgeon being um, being um, being uh, being in uh, OT with another very very complicated case. So there are multiple anatomical factors which can kind of um, put your patient at risk of coronary perforation. Heavy calcification as this patient had in her right coronary artery but not in her LED. Tortuous vessels, okay. Um, smaller diameter coronaries and I, I admit that I probably um, chased the distal LED a bit too much. And also CTO procedures. Um, procedural, factors, procedural factors include hydrophilic or stiff guide wires particularly for CTOs or um, distal perforations like my colleague used maybe um, hydrophilic wires. Um, oversized balloon, I think looking back in retrospect, I can appreciate that my uh, first inflation of the distal LED perhaps uh, put the um, balloon to vessel ratio higher than 1.1, 1 .1, 1 to 1. Um, small, small diameter stenting and also the usage of um, orbitals or rotablation. The, peric the management tips, as my colleague has elucidated, um, include things such as balloon tamponade, reversal of heparinization, fat embolization, um, surgery, of course, and the usage of covered stent. I'm not sure how useful anything apart from covered stents would be in this situation because um, if we look back at the um, in injury to the blood vessel, it was quite a longitudinal, longitudinal injury rather than a wire perforation or rather than a point uh, dissection so, or perforation. It was actually a quite a long um, longitudinal um, injury to the vessel. Overall, I think um, as a reminder to myself, and I've seen um, other cases which haven't turned out quite well, is um, for maintenance of the distal wire position. Because I think if I had lost um, distal wire perforation, it'd probably be near impossible to rewire this vessel. Okay, so that's my final slide. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. No, no, congratulations on your wonderful procedure after the big coronary perforation. So I have some several questions or comment that there is uh, uh, if I see the in a pre-procedural coronary angiogram, mm. it's very small size disarray. Yes, yes. If you uh, next time you think it's really needed to be recanalized in this distal LED. 
I think uh, in retrospect, I wouldn't have chased the distal LED. In fact, after I had put the covered stands, I lost all the septal branches mm -hmm. of that <laughs> of that uh, distal LED actually because um, I think trying to I think um, from next door as well, we can learn that cosmetic cosmetics may not be functional, and I think that I probably chased the cosmetics a bit mm -hmm. too much actually, um, admittedly. So and there also is uh, two in a the in a side two the in a covered stand. The sometimes it's, it's very difficult to get the, you know crossed in the first cover right. stand. Mm. So the one thing is that in the when we it's real difficult, maybe we can cross the the first cover stand with just a drug lifting stand, because mm. even though the in the drug lifting stand, sometimes we can some sealing, the, you know, mm. some like a perforated site. So it might be possible because you know, the in you know, many cases you know the you know, coronary perforation usually is uh, somewhat some very classified region mm -hmm. area. So it's not so easy to cross the you know some covered stand because it's a uh, too big the stand strut size. So I think it's somewhat the dual layer of the drug stand sometimes is uh, effective. Mm. So if we really cannot cross the in a region with the complication site, the in a population site, maybe we can cross the drug with stand. And then another thing is that in the when you finally see the in a you know, coronal angiogram is some dissected left main stem, mm. you just put the stand in the left main dissected area. But I think it's uh, maybe it's necessary to the see the in a dissect site by the imaging. Correct. Or I was probably mm. maybe we don't need in a stand. Yes. So I yeah. think it's uh, that there is some my comments. I think I was uh, overcome with the shock. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I, I never understand. had that kind of I complication. I understand your situation. Yeah. Okay. Um. So may I ask a question? So uh, I I saw all throughout the procedure you have a single access. Okay. So um, uh, what's the time interval between you? You know, you have a, a balloon to tamponade the perforation, and then you change and take it out and change to a, a, a stand graph, a cover stand. So so what, what is the time interval between that? Because you, we know that the, the perforation has not been sealed off anyway, Correct. so mm. uh, it may take a, quite a long time for you to take out the balloon and then put in a stand graph, which is a relatively difficult to mm. be delivered in this case. Mm -hmm. So uh, first of all, what was the time interval, you, time interval between this? Is it in terms of seconds or in terms of minutes? And follow up with that, um, I know, I know the, the vascular access may be difficult for this patient, but in case uh, the vascular access uh, is okay uh, for the, the other arm or for, 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 from the femoral, you may consider to put in um, or what you call a ping pong guiding, ping -pong guide. put, uh, yeah, put mm -hmm. in another, another system for a different purpose so that um, things will be much easier uh, and, and the time interval between uh, the, the, the taking out uh, our balloon and the first time will be much shortened so that the, the, the uh, leaking will be minimized and, and less likely to have a um, chance to uh, uh, progress in the pamphlet and um, uh, making uh, the patient in hemodynamic compromise. Correct, yeah. I think um, rightly so. I think I took, it took a couple of minutes as well for exchange of um, um, compliant into covered stents as well. And I think that I, but her, we did try to puncture femoral. It was fully calcified, mm. so I think uh, we just proceeded straight. Mm. I mean, of course, I think um, if we could manage some ping pong guide um, technique, um, going through beyond with a femoral catheter would probably been better. But unfortunately, uh, we tried to make do. Fortunately, there was a the I, we put in a pericardial drain, mm -hmm. uh, so that even though leaking actually helped to stabilize the blood pressure came up mm. um, again after that. Yep. And actually, you can, you you do not need an echo. You can see from the and yes. the, the heart is swinging. It is, yeah, yeah, the heart uh, is swinging. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, okay. uh, please. Okay. In in this case, you put the cover stand, two cover stand, mm. and a very long cover stand, mm. and the heart is not good. They have a hemodialysis. Yeah. So they have a chance to be, the least to be the stent thrombosis. Correct of the cover stand in the mm -hmm. future. Mm -hmm. So I think you should escalate uh, the anti-pellet 
to the more potent correct and maybe the wrong duration maybe mm. longer than one year mm. and you should education the patient about the dark compound yes uh, i think rightly so that was the main concern and fortunately in a way um one positive thing was that the covered stents were very distal um she of course has a high risk of um stent thrombosis especially you can see that the rca stent had already isr due to non compliance with statin but i did i try to educate her as much as i could with um dual antiplatelet therapy yeah yeah please very well managed case uh, i might be wrong in thinking if i'm wrong just correct me uh was your cover stent first cover stent was too short and too big in size hmm. now if you take from normal to normal that not more than 2.5 hmm. so what i felt was your first cover stent being too bigger could not close the perforation distally is it so this my thinking might be wrong um, i'm not difficult to say because i thought initially the the coverage was good and actually i mean 2.5 i just put it to nominal actually the time yeah the the first one it was too too big to maybe yeah maybe. that could have been reason that it was actually persisting that correct yeah perforation uh, might think i don't it, know it might be possible i mm, think yeah because it looked like it had failed mm. so the now the leak was distally like an mm. edge okay. like going backwards yeah mm. okay thank you okay thank, thank you. you very much so we move to the last presentation Okay, so let me introduce the last speaker, Dr. Lawan Chara, uh, from KMS Super Specialty Hospital in India, and he is going to share with us a case of coronary artery stem removal. Dr. Chara, please. Thanks for the kind invitation. My case is not going to be, you know, as uh, catastrophic as my previous colleagues, but still, let me see. I bring greeting from India. My patient was a 60-year-old female who had unstable angina, hypertensive diabetic. Routine blood mesh was normal, but troponin T was troponin I was positive, with reasonable junction fraction of 45 percent. Her angiography was done, which revealed critical LED lesion. The rest of us was normal. It looked the case could have been very simple. It was actually simple, and I made it complicated. So I preferred plan for PCI of LED. At that time, the old case we used to have a hydrophilic wire. So this is very old case. So cross with the wire and pre-dilated the lesion. So this was after pre-dilatation. Nothing wrong till now. I took a three into twenty-eight millimeter stent, and I felt stent was actually shorter than required. So I wanted to withdraw the stent. So attempt to withdraw the stent. Stent got dislodged from balloon into left main coronary artery to LED. This was stunned there, lying in left main, to LED, and you can see my balloon marker somewhere here, which says balloon is still there. Now, obviously, stunt uh, retrieval is not difficult. There are a lot of things are there. It can be twining of the wires, distal balloon inflation, and snaring of the stunt. I prefer snaring. While snaring was being done, patient went into hypotension, had signal adjustment, and. Uh, my catheter i have already snared the stent it was partially in guiding now my worry was that as i have already dilated already it might be occluding so i was wondering how to check it so this was the holding of the stent with a snare you can see the snare is here this is at that time patient was all right stent was held with the snare it was being withdrawn and that time she got hypertension Now my my worry was how to check LED and how to prevent vessel occlusion if at all it's happening. So at the same time, I need to maintain the guide wire position, and there's no way I can keep guide wire position at the same place and withdraw the stent. So obviously, as my previous like colleagues have presented, as one of the panelists were discussing, I thought of ping pong guiding. I took second guiding and took femoral approach. This is not two guidings are there, so I checked with another guiding. It was okay. Now, if you see the two wires across the lesion, so I was crossing with the second guide, the second wire. Now, pusher being stunt. This is stunt being withdrawn. Now you can see stunt is coming down. This is stunt is coming down. So stunt was withdrawn. Finally, stunt was taken out of patient. The two. 
puncture on the same site as left. She already had problem, so we could not. Anyhow, now successful angioplasty was done by using 333 stunt. This was angioplasty after using that. Good end result and a post reduction was done. This was the end result and patient was stable and discharged till she came back. Now she came back with another problem. She had chest pain, extensive interval MI with the action factor 20% from 45%. This was the second catastrophe I got. So she had thrombus obviously. So I tried reangioplasty and wire was crossed but balloon did not cross. So I thought as if my first wire might have gone through the stunt studs. So I put second wire and then I was able to dilate the lesion. And finally, both wires were there and I dilated the lesion. Patient was stabilized. So good end result, patient discharged in stable condition. So it proved simple case made complicated. So choose uh, adequate size stunt, always use preferably longer stunt. Never withdraw the undeployed stunt. If at all you want to withdraw, the most important point where the stunt is held up is not at the lesion site. It is mostly at the guiding edge where your stunt is not aligned with the guiding ostium. So you need to take the guiding out so that guiding is aligned with the stunt. That's a major thing. We have different techniques, obviously, but no technique will keep the wire there. We have to take the wire out until unless stent is already out of the wire. So we can entrap and technique, so many techniques are there. So control femoral puncture and simultaneous wiring reasonable option because first wire will help in crossing the lesion, across, crossing the lesion and that will maintain the wire across the position. Subacute stunt thrombosis and need agassi management. But more important is try to analyze the complication to prevent it. And I analyzed why second time behind I got from, from stunt thrombosis. If you see carefully, even second stunt was shorter in diameter. And I felt something was wrong at the ostium of second stunt also. Now see this thing. If you see carefully, we have something wrong here or something wrong here. Actually, I analyze it that second stent was also shorter as compared to the lesion site. So this is committing second blunder. You will see carefully now. The stent edge is actually at the lesion site. And probably that might be the reason for destruction and stent thrombosis after the second stent implantation. So Try to analyze the cause of any complication in future and learn from my mistake. Don't do it yourself. Thanks for your patience hearing. Thank you. So thank you very much for the, this interesting case. So may I ask a question? So um, do you feel, I mean, when you're doing the stand retrieval for the first time, when you think it's too short, do you feel the difficulty whether there is at the lesion site, whether it's a calcify or some, some resistance, or just as you mentioned, not at the lesion site, but uh, because of the uh, malalignment of the guiding, uh, when you retrieve into, in, in, back into the guiding? As for my thinking, is almost certain it was aligned guiding, not the lesion site. Mm -hmm. So that's why Stun got dislodged in left main. If it could have been difficulty at the lesion site, I should last stunned at the lesion site. It was left main to LED. Mm. The guiding was hooking up. Okay. That's why we have to take the guiding out in future so that stunt is aligned. Okay. Uh, I think the imaging procedure like the IWAS or the OCT is really useful in this case. Maybe we can uh, use for the lesion preparation before the stent or we can know the mechanism of the acute stent thrombosis. Do you have any uh, machine about IWUS or OCT in your cat lab? Yeah, I do have. I did not use in this patient. The patient was already so much unstable. I had a need to open the stunt first. So I did not use in this patient. So I think it's uh, in the past, you know, some like uh, it's very poor equipment of the, the stand, the mount in the balloon. In that time, I think it's, uh, it's many cases of the, the you know, uh, stand um, the the deployment in the in the unexpected site, but the recently I think it is not 
very rare case. So I think it's your previous you mentioned is that in the the guiding catheter, the could the stent the, the strut could some like uh, the blocking the stent withdrawal or using. But I think it's some um, that the you know when you pull the you know the you know the stent the balloon, probably if you stuck the you know balloon stand, maybe you just uh, put s s smoothly the, the push the in the slightly distal and then s smoothly the pull the stand. I think it's a, you know, usually it's no problem to stand withdraw, but in the, of course, in a, some is a, the accident is accident. So um, when you are, of course, in a, the, in a, the, the subacute stand thrombosis case, I think uh, what's the mechanism of the stubble sense embassies, you think? Uh, your first point, uh, <coughs> well taken, that uh, we should withdraw the stent once guiding is out. And in this case, what I felt, a second point was that this was a decade old case, as you are telling very perfectly that this is an old case, so that's why stent got just lost mm -hmm. because yes. of the poor yeah. mechanism. And the third point is that in this case, once I analyzed the second stent implantation, I was almost certain it was wrong technique. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with the stent. Mm -hmm. It was short stent. That could have been approximate mm -hmm. section. Mm -hmm. That could have the main cause for mm -hmm. thrombosis in this patient. Mm -hmm. So, good evening. Uh, another another cardiologist from India. Yeah. So I have a small case to share. This is very similar. This happened way back in uh, my student days. A similar stent dislodgement happened. And we tried a lot of techniques, snare, distal balloon. Ultimately, we couldn't do anything. Finally, we crushed the stent on the wall with another stent. So in India, everything runs on cost basis. How do you explain to the patient he's got a crushed stent inside? So finally, we ended up saying he's got two stents for the price of one. So he was stable and he's happy. Ultimately, we do have such complications all the time. True. Thanks once again for patience here. Thank you. Okay, so um, now we saw uh, four very interesting and very good cases of um, challenging cases of uh, intervention, and we have a good discussion with that. So um, with that, uh, we would like to close the session. We would like to thank uh, Michael Chatter and and also all the moderator, all, all, all the panelists, and all the audience for joining this session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you.